What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. As always, we are presented by Barstool Sports. If you want more great mafia content and crime content, Go check out my podcast, The Sit Down, a crime history podcast. You can find the link in the description of this video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, let's get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And in the world of the mafia, a name most synonymous with the American mafia over the last 50 years is Vincent Giganti. Vincent Giganti had four brothers, one of which we've talked about on this channel, Mario Giganti. He would have another brother that would follow him into life called Ralph. He would have two other brothers, though, one called Pasquale and one called the Father Louis Giganti. And the Father Louis Giganti on the surface was a priest, a former basketball star, and a man who was a developer who made the lives of his parishioners in the Bronx better. But there's more that we would learn about his brother. He was a glorified mob associate whose life in the end ended with embarrassment. The story of the father, Louis Giganti, next on Sit Down Shorts. Louis Giganti was born March 19th, 1932 in Manhattan. As we know, the Gigantes will grow up in Greenwich Village. Now, Louis Giganti would be the one brother, or in fact, the, the two brothers out of the five Giganti brothers that would not go into the life of the mafia per se. As a kid, he would actually be a pretty good student on all accounts and was very good in his classes. By his high school years, he would actually attend Cardinal Hayes High School in the Bronx on the Grand Concourse. Now, for Louis Giganti, it was not just school that he was good at. He would also excel at basketball. In 1949, Louis Giganti would actually lead the Cardinal Hayes boys basketball team to a Catholic League City Championship. He was a very accomplished point guard, and that would earn him an athletic scholarship to Georgetown University. Now, during his time at Georgetown and on the basketball team, his team would never actually get to the NCAA tournament. Other than one year, they would actually get to the NIT, which is uh, the level of tournament just below the NCAA tournament, where they would bow out in the first round. In four years, he would average just over nine points a game, and was said to be a very skilled passer and leader, and was the captain of the team. Upon his graduation from Georgetown, the father, Louis Giganti, would go to the St. Joe Seminary in Yonkers. That is where, in 1959, he would become an ordained minister and priest. Uh, he wanted to be a priest, and the truth of the matter was, in those days, in the Italian neighborhoods of New York and some of the other ethnic enclaves, you became one of three things. It was pretty factual. A cop or a uh, civil servant, a priest, or a gangster. Now, for Louis Giganti, he would head off to Puerto Rico upon his ordainment and actually serve at a parish in San Juan where he would actually take up Spanish. And that would provide very important uh, to the parish that he would dedicate his life to down the road. Now, upon his return two years later in the early 60s uh, from Puerto Rico, he would actually serve in a parish on the Lower East Side called the St. James Church. Now, around this time, his brother Vincent is actually taking a different way in his life. As we know, by this point, Vincent Giganti is a very high-ranking member of the Genovese crime family, particularly in the Greenwich Village crew. We would now know that in the late 50s, Giganti orchestrated the attempted assassination of Frank Costello. He would become very high up to Vito Genovese, as we know, and was actually at one point during this time serving prison time for narcotics conspiracies. Now, his brother, Louis Giganti, would head off to the Lower East Side, where he would actually be caught at one point, according to the Village Voice, a ghetto priest. Now, this would contend that you know, during his time in the Lower East Side, Louis Giganti, like many priests in those days, uh, was very close with his community. Uh, at one point, it was also talked about that the father actually prevented a large street fight between rival gangs on Catherine Street on the Lower East Side. We know back then that there were 
many, many rumbles involving these local street gangs. And, you know, as I said, priests back then, particularly in the Catholic faith, were very involved in the community. They were making sure kids were staying off the street. They were trying to get jobs for the people in the neighborhood. They were actually acting as community organizers as well. And I liken it really, if you've ever seen the film Sleepers, uh, the character that De Niro plays, Father Bobby, he acts as a really quasi father figure to the four kids in the, in the film. He, you know, would know them throughout their whole life. He would act getting them jobs, trying to keep them off the street, getting them different tasks that they can complete. So they're not on the street. Um, in a way, I think father Louis Giganti really early in his career acted as that eventually though, he would settle upon his home parish. And that would be at the, uh, uh, St. Athanasius, uh, Roman Catholic church in the Bronx on Tiffany street. Uh, this would be father Louis Giganti's parish, really his entire life as a priest. The thing though, about Louis Giganti is he had the Giganti blood in him. And for him being a priest was not enough. He knew of the power and prestige that his brother had, and he wanted it as well. And this would not be uh, the last time we would hear from Louis Giganti. Eventually Louis Giganti would start getting involved in his neighborhood. And by knowing Spanish and being uh, close with a lot of parishioners, he could do a lot of things for the people of the parish back then. He would set up anti-poverty programs and help the uh, community through funding and, and different things, really just kind of being a safe haven for the people of Hunts Point and the South Bronx. Um, at one point, though, he would, by the late 60s, take up becoming a politician. He wanted that power and prestige. He would lose initially. And in fact, in one situation, Mr. Giganti would get into a sparring match, literally and figuratively, with his opponent, Ramon Velez. At one point, Louis Giganti would, would essentially say that Velez was a, uh, a slum landlord, a real bad individual, and he should not have any um, involvement in the prestige of the community, to which Velez would respond by calling Mr. Giganti, quote, a maricón. Now, um, if you don't speak Spanish, that basically is referring to the fact that he said that Giganti was a homosexual. Now, again, it was probably just a barb, if you will, but this would allow uh, Velez basically be socked in the face by uh, Mr. Giganti. So even though he was a priest, he was willing to do what he had to do he would ultimately win a city council race uh, and continue to try to uh, make bids for higher office in the mid 70s. He wanted that power like his brother had in the Genovese crime family. By this point in the early 70s, Vincent Giganti was a very high ranking member of the Genovese crime family. And by the early 80s, he was the boss of the Genovese crime family. I also want to kind of highlight some of the connections that Louis Giganti had to the mob world. I don't care how you spin it. Louis Giganti was a mob associate. It's that simple. Okay. And I'll explain why here in just a second. It was interesting in 1977, Louis Giganti would actually serve prison time about a week after he failed to talk to the courts in a case involving James Jimmy Knapp Napoli. Now, Jimmy Knapp is a huge earner and member of the Genovese crime family. It was said that at one point in 1974, uh, the father, Louis Giganti, was actually uh, ferrying Mr. Napoli uh, goods and different things while he was in prison, trying to protect him in a way. And that is illegal. You cannot give contraband to uh, inmates. Now, uh, the higher powers that be wanted to talk to Mr. Giganti and he decided that he didn't want to talk. So uh, they sent him to prison for a period of time upon release. And throughout his life, he would rail against people that talked about the mafia. He would claim that it didn't exist and it was an anti-Italian thing. Um, so Mr. Giganti had a lot of ties to uh, the mafia. Uh, it was though something though that he decided though that he wanted to do was become a developer. And by the early seventies, uh, he would become just that. He wanted to take over the South Bronx and really transform it into a place where his congregation and parishioners uh, could live better lives. At one point, he would say about his rejuvenation of the Bronx, I brought the neighborhood up from ashes to help the people in the South Bronx. There isn't one other organization that can take credit. And essentially what Mr. Giganti did, the father did, was he would create low-income housing developments uh, for um, parishioners. He would create a company called SEBCO, the Southeast Bronx Community Organization, which in, in essence was funding 
uh, the creation of housing projects for Section 8 residents through federal funds. Um, the thing that, though, Louis Giganti was also doing was through these federally funded housing projects, he was lining the pockets of the mafia. Louis Giganti realized that he could steer tens of millions of construction contracts uh, to mobsters. So was he doing good things? Yes. But we'll find out later that he really wasn't doing that many good things and that he was just building faulty apartment buildings and lining the pockets of his brother's people. Because in the end, most of the people he was dealing with, dealing with, guess who they were kicking up to? His brother, Vincent Giganti. So in essence, he is one of the wheels that's turning the Genovese crime family and knows what made them into such a huge organization in the 80s and 90s. One of the chief people that Louis Giganti was dealing with directly was Vincent DiNapoli. Now, if you know anything about Vincent DiNapoli, he is a construction magnet, if you will, owned all sorts of different companies, including two different drywall companies. Now, by this point uh, in the late 70s, he is a convicted felon. Uh, but for the first three years of both drywall businesses that he had, Mr. DiNapoli uh, secured $25 million in federally financed contracts for drywall work. He handled the drywall and all the money that he's making is in turn going back to the Genovese crime family. Vincent DiNapoli was a very accomplished earner and a big time magnet for the Genovese crime family. Now, ultimately in 1983, Vincent DiNapoli would go to prison for his behavior, but that would not stop the money from turning. We would find out as well that famed Lucchese underboss and who's now serving a life sentence for the murder, allegedly, of Michael Meldish. Stephen Crea was actually, when we first got involved in the mafia, was very connected to Vincent DiNapoli, at one point being called a protege of Mr. DiNapoli. It was said that in the early 80s, uh, to continue the contracts and the work, uh, Mr. Crea would allegedly visit Mr. DiNapoli 35 different times uh, in FCI Danbury in Connecticut. So what was clear was the work continued. Denapoli might have been away, but Crea continued all this construction. He was also very close to the father, Louis Giganti. In fact, in 1985, uh, Mr. Crea was actually convicted uh, of conspiracy to kill a man who he alleged assaulted his wife. Uh, Mr. Giganti would write a letter to the judge in that case, basically calling Mr. Crea an upstanding individual, a great friend. He was being persecuted. And in fact, in 1987, whether it helped or hurt Mr. Crea, in 1987, Mr. Crea's conviction was actually overturned. And Mr. Crea headed back out on the streets. It was also said that uh, Mr. Giganti did a lot of work through construction with Genovese heavyweight in unions, Louis Muscatiello. So what we're finding out here is, okay, while Louis Giganti is a priest and a political man, he also wants prestige and money, and he wants to create uh, an ability for him to live the life of luxury and have that prestige and power that his brother had. And guess what? The only people benefiting from all this stuff is the Genovese crime family and other members of the mafia. Now, the people in Hunts Point began to complain. Hunts Point is a fairly industrial area of the Bronx, and this is a photo of present-day Hunts Point. But back then in the 80s and 90s, the people of Hunts Point and the people of the parish of Louis Giganti were complaining. They would basically say that they were living in poverty, and Mr. Giganti, the father, who barely was a priest anymore, was living a life of luxury. It was said that Louis Giganti had multiple apartments in New York City, a home in upstate New York, a condo in Puerto Rico, six automobiles, multiple real estate holdings and apartments, as well as other high life activities. So Louis Giganti was living at, like a king with his brother and all these different people. And the people of his parish were living like uh, basically below the poverty line and were, were living like, um, you know, second class citizens. So he's acting as this big hero. He's doing all this stuff in the Bronx. And look, I think initially he probably was. But as we know, urban decay happens. And I'll point out that by the 2000s, we would learn a lot of really scammy, um, bad things about Louis Giganti as far as the kind of behavior he was doing. Louis Giganti also wanted to be a movie star. In fact, he would act in the late 80s film, The Last Rites, starring Tom Berenger, who now 
Tom Berenger acted in films like Major League. And essentially the film was about, um, you know, really the story of Father Louis Giganti. And Louis Giganti would act in the film as a bishop. Uh, so let's backtrack here. Louis Giganti is a movie star. He's a priest. He's a political uh, pariah. He's a money earner for the Genovese crime family. And he is a construction tycoon. He truly was uh, a man of legend. And he was a bon vivant. If you will, we would also find out that Louis Giganti was a money launderer as well. It was said in a 1985 FBI affidavit that he was acting as a money funneler from Morris Levy, the record producer who was basically owned by the Genovese crime family to his brother, Vincent Giganti, to basically hide a funds that Levy was um, extorting to uh, Mr. Giganti. He was using real estate holdings to essentially give to Mr. Giganti. And the brother, Louis, was the man that was funneling those things to happen. Now, Louis Giganti would say years later that, quote, it was uh, a bold-faced lie to a letter he penned to a judge. Um, but by the early 90s, Louis Giganti continues to fight legal battles for his brother, Vincent, and ultimately acts as a quasi-spokesperson uh, as well. It's interesting, as at one point... Uh, Louis Giganti would continue to belittle the parishioners of his parish. Uh, during one sermon, he would talk about the fact that the neighborhood was uh, you know, dealing with inoperable crime at one point. He would say, quote, we have allowed crime and violence to invade all of our neighborhoods. We have accepted this violence and we have accepted the crime and drugs that comes with it. This violence against our people happens every day on the streets outside this very church. Think of the arrogant individual Mr. Giganti is. He is belittling the mostly Latin parishioners that he has because of the fact that they're selling drugs just to survive, likely, as he you know, gallivants in and up and around the Upper East Side and Lower East Side uh, with his mob uh, family members and buddies. So it's okay for them to be criminals, but in the case of his uh, under-the-poverty-line parishioners, just to survive, I'm going to belittle them for what they do. This guy was a real scoundrel and a scam artist. And we would learn that pretty quickly. By 1997, the father, Louis Giganti, continued to act as a spokesperson for his brother. He would be regularly seen in the early 90s, constantly in contact with his brother as his brother feigned insanity as the boss of the Genovese crime family. Louis would say at one point that uh, the mafia didn't exist and that it was an anti-Italian discrimination attempt by the federal government. Uh, he constantly held the water for his brother. Uh, and at one point, we would also learn a fairly interesting uh, point about Louis Giganti. In the 2000s, uh, former Genovese hitman George Barone would decide to cooperate against the Genovese crime family. He would say that the father, Louis Giganti, upon the uh, conviction of his brother, would continue in the late 90s to act as a messenger for his brother. George Barone would say, quote, that uh, when asked if Chin was still in control, that yes, uh, they do, and they will probably always continue to rule the Genovese crime family. Uh, through his brother, the priest, he would send messages out. We know that v Vincent G uh, Giganti was constantly using people to ferry messages, whether it was Brother Mario or Dom Cirillo. We would also find out that the Father Louis Giganti was doing that as well. This guy was a mob associate. He did not have his finger pricked and was not a mob soldier, uh, but he was just as important to the mafia as anyone in the Genovese crime family. Let's just stop pretending. Um, I do, though, before we end this, I want to get into some of the things we would learn about Louis Giganti in the 2000s. By that time, it was estimated that uh, Mr. Giganti created 2,000 housing units uh, for the people of the Bronx through $50 million or more in federal funds from the government for Section 8 housing. The problem was... By 2006, most of the buildings were falling apart. In fact, in 2006, we would learn a bizarre uh, story about one of the units that his was that he had created. A person would contend that in 2006, they received a Con Edison bill in upwards of $15,000 for electric that uh, the father's company did not pay for the residents of the unit. Um, Essentially, he was defaulting on paying the utilities for these buildings through the $2 million a year he was making in rental proceeds from being a Section 8 landlord. Now, we would also learn that the company um, was in default in all these different bills and that 
uh, the units were essentially falling apart. Um, they were full of mold. There were holes that were developing. Um, proper security uh, wasn't uh, going on at these places. Doors were widely opened. We would learn stories that uh, psychiatric patients were going into these buildings and assaulting people because they weren't locked properly. Uh, we would just learn a lot of horrors from these places. In fact, uh, one woman would actually discuss this. Uh, a woman we would learn uh, called um, Mildred Cologne. Miss Cologne was a resident of this one of the buildings. She would say, quote, I'm fighting because I've lived in this building for 24 years. I love my community. But the conditions have gotten so bad, I can't continue to let Father Giganti and Sebco take over. The father said that this is his community, but he doesn't live here. He hasn't saved the neighborhood. He abused this neighborhood. I may be slow to understand his bullshit, but I'm not stupid. Now, she was not just the one person that spoke up about this community. Hordes and hordes of parishioners and people of the Bronx would stand up and say, this guy is a slum landlord. He's too old. He's not running these buildings correctly. He built them with faulty materials. Uh, it was just a complete mess. And by the end, Louis Giganti really just became a slum landlord and an embarrassment. We would also find out some very disturbing things about the father, Louis Giganti, late in his life. In 2021, according to a blog written by Jerry Capici at Gangland News, uh, and by other publications, in his late 80s, two individuals in their 50s would accuse Mr. Giganti of, in 1976 and 1977, of S.A. Um, now, I'm not going to discuss what S.A. is. You can kind of probably understand through what I'm about to talk about. At his parish at the time, Mr. Giganti was in charge of Bible studies. Now, one male and one female would basically essentially say that uh, the father, Lewis, um, abused them uh, as children. Uh, now, the 13-page complaint uh, would state that according to the lawyer of these people, Antigone Curris, she would say that the plaintiff was forced to endure prolific and profound abuse from Father Giganti. He would find ways to get plaintiff alone after Bible study and repeatedly abused him, the attorney wrote. Uh, now, we would also find out that a girl uh, would also come forward. Now, we would find out that in the Catholic sex abuse cases that it often takes individuals who are abused into their 40s or 50s to report that this stuff is actually going on. Now, I do want to make this clear, okay, importantly, that these cases have not been tried yet uh, in the New York State uh, court systems. Uh, so we don't actually know if they happened. The father never really commented on this. Now, I will state, he was a burgeoning member of society in the community for years, according to most, and none of this had ever come up. Now, as I said, a lot of times, I'm not saying these people weren't abused, but often it does take years for them to come out and talk about this. We can contend that it wasn't just one person. Multiple people were saying that they were abused by Mr. Giganti. We ultimately probably won't ever find that out either. On October 23rd, 2022, the father, Louis Giganti, died at the age of 90. We can look back on his life and on the surface, many people would see the fact that he was a priest, he was a developer, and helped the people of the Bronx. In essence, though, that's just not true. The father, Louis Giganti, was no different of a gangster than his two brothers. This guy portrayed through the veil of religion the fact that he was this God-fearing man who helped the people of his community. In essence, all the money he made really just kicked up to his own pocket and the pockets of the Genovese crime family. In the end, he was a slum landlord, a scoundrel, a scumbag, and most likely a pedophile. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comments below. Also in the comments, please feel free to let me know of any people in organized crime that I haven't covered that you'd like me to cover. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss another sit-down video. We'll see you next time here on The Sit-Down.